Father, we thank you for the day. We thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. Father, the opportunity to be gathered together for, for today, for the purpose we are, to worship you. Father, we just pray that everything we do is pleasing to you. We pray now that you'll be with Dan, that he can speak clearly to us and share his ministry. Father, that we will listen closely as we need to make an educated decision about their ministry and what they're doing. Father, just to continue to bless them and up with them. Father, be with all of us today that we can totally love you and adore you through this time. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Just a point of clarification. Are you Bill or are you Bill? <laughs> I've, I've, known, I've known Bill. Uh, who you are. Just look in the post. There it is. I, see. I thought it was. <coughs> My name is Dan Underwood. Um, my wife, Tony, is not with me today. She's back in Belize. We work with an organization out of Lexington, Kentucky called Team Mission USA. They're kind of being rebranded as he steps on the screen. You really need to screen your speaker. Um, as Mission Journeys, but we live in Belize. We come, I come back every one or two years. We haven't figured that it's two years. Um, to kind of connect where we live in Belize. Our ministry is called the Barnabas Project. It is a ministry of training, education, encouragement. Uh, primarily we work in six different villages right now. Um, they're kind of lined up. The needs are different and so our ministry is different, but it does center around leadership development, pastor training, uh, discipling. It, it, it involves uh, working with at-risk kids. Uh, I'm going to kind of point you to a couple of things. I do have a newsletter back on the table. It is two pages. Okay? Um, two pages. So if you want to pick up copies, they're, they're, they're free. This is a little bit of a promotional device that will tell you a little bit about uh, what we do. As I said, our ministry is varied. One of the things that we're doing right now actually is getting ready for a Christmas program. We're doing, we're doing a musical drama that will be presented uh, as a community outreach, as a village outreach on the 21st of December. I'm gonna go real high tech with you. I have, a, I have a, an excerpt of one of the songs. I realize it's a little bit, how, how many of you have started putting up your Christmas? If you're, if, wait a minute, if you're leaving today for Christmas trees, I'm allowed to play Christmas music, right? Okay. So, uh, I got my deer on, see. Pardon me. <laughs> deer on. Well, I'm, not, I'm not even gonna go there. So. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we can we can hear this. This is just an excerpt of one of the songs, and I'll actually explain to you why I'm using this excerpt this morning. Can you hear this? No? I do. Can we plug this in? Do you have a microphone? Uh, right, well, just listen. I'll, I'll sing along. How's that? It goes like this. Born in a stable 2,000 years ago, Jesus Messiah, Emmanuel is here. Angels rejoicing, announcing royal birth. Shepherds surrounded by joy and holy fear. How could that night have been a silent night when all of heaven was praising? How could we have been too busy for your word? Spoken in the flesh with life brand new. You are the child of hope. A precious gift from heaven above. That's just a clip. Now, the reason that I'm sharing that is... Not just to tell you that that's one of the songs that we're doing with the with community. Actually, it's a community of Coptry, Harmonyville, and St. Matthews. But I'm using it to illustrate kind of the idea of partnering. For those of you that could hear that, 
the person playing the keyboard was Jeff Hampton through the miracles of modern technology. It wasn't just his, he was actually, it, it, could you hear it well enough? You could tell that was Jeff, right? That was, that was, that was Jeff playing. So you have Jeff here, we have the Legion and Jeff down there. And there will be at least three songs that he's actually played um, that we recorded some time ago digitally. It's been remastered. And so the reason I'm saying that is that really is what we're talking about when we're talking about partnering. In a very real way, Jeff, through his music, has a ministry at Belize. He's here, but his music through the Barnes Project is in Belize. That's really what we're looking to do in a variety of ways, to partner with people that have a passion for communicating a message of hope and of peace and of joy to people that need to hear that. Now, whether that's down the street or whether that's in Central America, that's our calling. That's the calling of this body of believers. That's the calling that Tony and I have. That's why we live in a little town, a little village called Las Flores. That's why we go to these villages, why we do Christmas musicals or preach revivals or do youth seminars, training. It is about sharing Jesus with those who need to know Jesus. We'd like for you to at least consider continuing to partner with us. You may not be able to go to Belize. Now, some of you may. But do understand that the support that all of our partners provide goes very directly in ministering to people. It's not simply paying our bill. It is, it is playing a song. It's, it's teaching a lesson. It's connecting with someone that needs to know Jesus. We are, we're excited about doing that. We've been there nearly five years, and we believe that God is just continuing to open up doors. It really, we feel like we've not even scratched the surface of what can be done. So we're looking for people that want to be a part of that. The, the, the brochures that you have in the back kind of explain that. We'll show some of the pictures of, of, of what we're doing. One of the exciting things that we're talking about, uh, I made friends with, a, with an individual from the States. He worked in the embassy. His name is Philip Wilson. His wife is a doctor from Nicaragua. Her name is Maritza. They went back to the States. Part of my travel this three-week period of time was to go up and see them in Washington, D.C. He's presently working with the State Department, but he will be moving this summer to Managua, Nicaragua. And so the Barnabas Project seems to be expanding even beyond Belize. We are hoping to be able to offer a short-term mission project to the Managua, Nicaragua area. Um, Maritza is, her family is there. She's very well versed in that. She is a doctor. She has a passion not only to heal physically, but to heal spiritually. Um, and so we're, we're expanding really from from not just Belize, but to Nicaragua as well. I say that to let you know that we're really not driving the bus. What I would talk about, what you would read about, is not something that we're actively pursuing, saying, hey, we're doing this, we'd like to do that, can we help? I don't know if I mentioned to the Sunday school class or not, in the five years that we've been there, we have only done what we have been asked to do. I had a stroke about eight years ago and realized that my my long-term plans had to be short-term plans, and so we begin to discuss that as God opened doors, we would immediately go through, and we would not try to force any door that He didn't open. I want to tell you that there is a freedom, and there is a there is a joy in simply allowing God to open doors and to walk through. So what we do, we do because we honestly believe God has opened that door. We're, we're training pastors. We're developing. Uh, we're, we're developing leaders that not only affect Belize. Belize is a small country, but it seems to be an intersection of the world, right? It just right now, people that have gone through our training are people of influence that have now scattered to 11 different countries worldwide: uh, Taiwan, uh, Scotland, Guyana, Cuba. These are people that have heard just a very simple gospel message and have gotten excited about what Jesus can do in the lives of other people, and they've been sent back to their home countries to continue the message. That's what we're inviting people to partner with us to do. To do something in Belize, yes, but around the world. To do something for the kingdom of God. To be faithful in sharing His message until He comes.
That's what we're here to do today, to celebrate that. So I'm going to turn it over to the praise team, and let's praise the God that came to save the world, you and me. Thank you. Peace be
being the time of year it is, we're all coming to that time where we set aside the time to give thanks, especially. I thought I would look at what does Thanksgiving mean? The Nelson Bible Dictionary defined Thanksgiving in the following manner. The importance and spiritual benefits of Thanksgiving in our life cannot be overemphasized. James tells us that God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. But the question is, how do you become humble? It is done by being thankful. A good rule is to remember what Philippians 4, 6 tell us. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God your needs and don't forget to thank Him for His answers. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 reminds us that no matter what happens, always be thankful. For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. There are two main things we are to thank God for. John the Apostle tells us we are to give thanks to God for His work of creation. Note the words of this song of praise by the 24 elders in Revelation 4.11. O oh Lord, You are worthy to receive the glory and the honor and the power. For You have created all things. They were created and called into being by Your act of will. Secondly, we are to thank Him for His work in redemption. John in Revelation 5, chapter 5, verse 9 also informs us that our second song in heaven will feature thanksgiving for God's work in redemption. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Obviously, we're talking about Jesus there, the Lamb. We have been redeemed to God by the blood of Jesus Christ. And because of this, all of our thanksgiving should revolve around this truth. This is the purpose of communion. To remember Jesus, His love, his obedience, His sacrifice, and to give thanks for what Jesus did for us on the cross. Can you pray with me? Father, we have so much to be thankful for. First of all, Father, we'd like to thank You for loving us to the point that You sent Your family God and Son in this earth to die for us, to shed His blood in His body, as pain for our sins. So as we partake of these holy sacraments, let us not forget what it's all about. It is because of your love, and this is the way that we can commune with you. Thank you for this, my this in Jesus' name. Amen.
right? Yeah. So, uh, so that you know, looking around here, um, next week's menu is two steaks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what happens if you feed them, they will come. Yeah. Uh, it's good. It is good to see everybody out, um, especially on, on the season that we're going to be we're going to be talking about here, Thanksgiving. Um, how many of you know what Thanks is all about? Eight of you. He just read it to you. I, I have to say thanks to Mike because uh, he had me scampered back there. As he spoke, I said, well, there goes point one of my sermon. There goes point two of my sermon. Well, why don't you take the whole thing? Thanks. You know? So, I was going to say, we could, we could pray and eat. Kind of reminds me of a, kind of reminds me of a story. Uh, a lady was at the mall, and she went by Cookie World, and she bought a little bag of cookies, and she thought, I'm going to sit down at this table here, and I'm going to enjoy my cookies and my hot chocolate and, and read part of my book. And the food court was kind of crowded, and she sat down, and, and a man sat at the table with her. And uh, he reached in the bag of cookies and started to eat one. And she thought, well, that's pretty bold. So she reached in, and she got one, and she started eating it. So when they got done with it, he reached in and got a second one. She said, it started getting my dander up a little bit. You know, how dare him sit here? So she ate a second one, and she started looking, and she thought, well, there's only one left. And the man reached into the bag, broke it in half, gave her half, ate his half, picked up the bag, wadded it up, walked away, threw it away, and walked off. And she thought, I've never seen anything so rude. I just can't believe it. She reached out in her bag to get her book out, and there was her bag of cookies. <laughs> now, she was thinking, oh my gosh, how rude, how this. How many of us, how many of us treat God like that? He has the cookies set now, and we're eating from them. And the whole time we're thinking, well, why didn't he do this for me? Or why didn't he do that for me? Well, where is he on this? You know, We question and also about that, but and then come to find out it was his blessings all along. You know, and we need to learn to give thanks. I want us to turn to uh, the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, Old Testament book. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Don't you note the time I got up late. I'm going to be here a while. That's okay, I'm going to feed you later. Oh, yeah. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 7 through 18. Verses 7 through 18. It reads like this, For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land with streams and pools of water, with springs flowing in the valleys and hills, a land with wheat and barley, vines and fig trees, pomegranates, olive oil and honey, a land where bread will not be scarce and where you will lack nothing, a land where the rocks are iron and you can dig copper out of the hills. When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land He has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, and His decrees that I am giving you this day. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, and your silver and gold increase, and all you have is multiplied, then your heart will become proud, and you will forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, he led you through the vast and dreadful desert, that thirsty and waterless land with its venomous snakes and scorpions. He brought you water out of the hard rock. He gave you manna to eat in the desert, something your fathers had never known, to humble and to test you so that in the end it might go well with you. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember, the Lord your God, for it is He who gives you the ability to produce wealth, 
and so confirms his covenant which he swore to his forefathers as it is today. What does that say? It, it's real simple. Without God, we have nothing. You know, he gave you the ability to do what you do. He gave you the ability to be what you are. I mean, my son Jacob got up yesterday morning. He had, he had long days. He spent a 24-hour shift Thursday at the firehouse. Got up that morning after serving all the time. Got in his truck and went to work doing construction. Worked all day. Came home, said, man, I haven't seen Taryn all week. I'm going to go see her. I know that I went to bed at midnight. And I had not seen myself. Yeah. So a late night for him. And then early Saturday morning, he got up and went hunting for 10 hours. And he got his three birds. That's a bird every three and a third hour. You know what that is to me? That kind of word. <laughs> Boring. <laughs> a lot of walking. But he loves it. You know? And, and I, I wondered, did he give thanks for his three hours? Did he give thanks he was even able to get up in the morning after those long days to go and do that? You know? And, and I'll use that as an example because it's something simple, but yet look at all of us. How many of us take time every day to give thanks? I mean, here, God is leading His people. You remember what happened? When He was leading those people? Do you remember what took place? They grunted, they grumbled. They, some said, why did we, Let's go back. You remember, they, they walked across a dry ground in the middle of the Red Sea. A pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night led them. He said it there, water from a rock, manna from heaven. He gave them and supplied absolutely everything they needed to get through that sea and through the desert to get to what He had promised them. And what was it? A promised land. You heard it there. Flowing with everything they could want. Okay. How many of you understand that you live in a promised land? We live in a country where everything is at our grasp. And you want wealth? Bust your butt, go out, work hard, and get it. That's all you have to do. It's there for the taking if you go. But we have to understand this. Who supplied it? God. Who gave you the abilities and talents you have? God. He gave you the very life that you live. So everything is His. And we have to give Him thanks continually for that. I mean, I can go back years. I can remember living in a little house next to a church in Portsmouth, Ohio. I remember the condition of that house. I couldn't go upstairs. Because the floors were so rotted, they were afraid I would fall through. I had the living room, front living room, as a bedroom with a sheet hanging over the doorway to the other living room where everybody would come and sit. I had a little bathroom and I had a kitchen. And the church says, well, that's fine. You're, you're single, you're a young man, not a problem. Okay. My beds, two twin beds, um, the man, Harold Coppage, who had them, had them 37 years. He got new beds and donated them so that the youth minister could be comfortable. Um, youth minister went out and bought a couch and enjoyed that couch. Um, I remember those things. And, and you know, at the time I was in that, I was thinking, I can't believe they want me to live like that. I remember getting money together and going up and getting an apartment. And immediately, upon getting the apartment, what did the church do? I tore the house down. That sorry old site, let's get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> hey! 
And, and I went through it. And you know, I look at it today and I was like, I should have been thankful for that house. You know what it cost me? Nothing. You know what the apartment cost me? I'm thinking, huh. and, and I, I have witnesses to this. Dan Underwood, I've known him for years. Dan Underwood was traveling with the group, and they would sometimes come through town, and they'd be so tired to be like, hey, can we crash here? Feel free, you can have the beds. <laughs> I, was a, I was a good host. But I would give it to them because, because they were there. So, and when they were tearing down the house, the insulation, I mean, in the wintertime, I closed off every room, and I lived in the living room, and I had a, a, a kerosene heater trying to keep warm. And when the wind would blow, you felt it in the house. Now, when they're tearing down the house, here's what it was. It was paneling on top of these wooden slats this far apart, stuffed with newspaper and pantyhose and anything they could get to put in the walls to insulate with. And I'm thinking, man, I lived there. Today, I wouldn't have lived anywhere else. The experiences in that house. I mean, we made it into a spook house at Halloween. It was a real spook house. We went upstairs. <laughs> we cut the stairs out so people could reach through and grab people's feet. I mean, I, I, I did my youth ministry for years on, on this bad thing, on this bad dilemma. And, and I don't, shouldn't, can't, well, it's something you shouldn't live by. But I was living by it. I would ask the men of church, hey, I'd like to do this, and they'd be like, no. You see, I had $1,000 a year. $1,000 a year to run youth ministry, Sunday school, and any events I wanted to do. And so I was I was king of the fundraiser. And we did car, we, we did a little bit of everything. I put a soda machine on the church. The soda machine the first year made me $2,800 profit. Nice. Nice. Parents didn't like the kids were all on a sugar high, but they didn't have any And I go through the, and I'm looking through the, and I am so thankful for that. That I learned how to do those things. I, I live by this premise. It's easier to get forgiveness than it is permission. I asked the men, can I run this thing called the feast? And I'm going to do this Friday, Saturday, Saturday thing, and, and they're going to spend a night, and we're going to do all this stuff, and, and we're going to have this. No. Next time you I said, okay. I already had it all planned. I already had the speakers lined up. I already had everything done. So, so I went through with the feast. I took my money and I bought hats with a with a burger, a hamburger, eaten, kind of neat logo. Um, I went out and got pizza boxes. And when you opened up the pizza box, it had a tablet in it with a pencil and everything. It had little buttons for the kids to wear that they were part of the feast and all this stuff. I said, I can't. I got to go through with it. So we went through with it. At the end of the feast that year, first year, 318 kids show up at our feast. We lived in Portsmouth, Ohio, where there wasn't much, and when the church did something, they came. And, and it was just full. We went roller skating, and I rented out the rink for three hours. We went to the movie theater and saw a Christian movie on the big screen where we rent out the theater. We went to Fred's Pizza. At three in the morning, he opened up for us. And we had the, he, had, he has these 48-inch Whoppers, they call them. They're huge pizzas. They actually sit on this tall podium. You eat under the pizza, look at each other, and reach up and grab the pizza. It, it's awesome. So we had all these kids there doing this stuff. We had this feast. Afterwards, the chairman of the elders said to me, I had him there. He was my door guard. <laughs> doing all things. And he said, what an awesome event. He said, did we make anything on it? You yeah. made a little bit of money on it. He said, man, I am so glad that, that you did that event. I said, I am so glad that you guys said no. <laughs> but he said, what? I look back on those days and I'm so thankful that, that it taught me to do things we do to get to where we are. You know, we, we, we still do fundraisers. You know that? We're going to sell Christmas trees. And, and it's for a purpose. It's for a ministry that we're doing. It's, in, it's going into a thing. I mean, it's stuff that we do. And we got to treat God like we ourselves only treat. 
Now, I look back and I think, do I want God to say uh, it's easier to get forgiveness than permission? Or do I want permission from Him for the things I do? See, I learned over the years, i got to bathe everything in prayer. i got to make sure that God's the center of it. Because trust me, I, I did some events that were uh, horrible. I did events where I lost big money. Because I thought, well, I'm, we're, we're just do this. The words were, I'll do this. And I did it and put it on, and it, and it didn't work. And look back, it's like, why didn't that work? Well, who were you doing it for? God. What place did God have in it? No. What did you do for God through it? No. Why didn't it work? Because it was my event. Done my way, how I want it, not His event. Done His way, what He wanted. And I, I've learned over the years that, that I've got to do it His way. And when I do it His way, and it's, it's, it's a success. That feast was a, a success. Do you know what me and my team did? 28 of us. We had a feast of Thanksgiving at the end of the feast. We ate leftover popcorn, leftover pizza, leftover soda. <laughs> we did. And we called our feast. It was the best feast we've ever had. Why? Because what it celebrated. What did it celebrate? God. God and His faithfulness with these kids to give them what they had. Now, you can go through here and you can look that Moses is talking and, and he's trying to lead the people. What do we know about these people? Because of their grumbling, because of their fussing, because of their just... Remember in the midst of it they made a golden cat? Because of their disobedience, what? Not one of them in that generation were allowed to what? Enter the promised land. They got to the border and could see it, but not allowed it because of that. Okay, we have to understand that God inhabits our praise. God desires our praise, but God also wants our thanks. When you should have died in that car wreck, thank you, God. When you defeat cancer, thank you, God. When a loved one that is suffering is finally taken home, thank you, God. When you go through all the different things of this life, thank you, God. And it's not just thank you on Thanksgiving. Is it? It's thank you all the time. See, in the, in the Depression, there was a, what they call an ecumenical council held. You know what that is? You know what an ecumenical council is? That's where a bunch of ministers and high ups in churches get together and say, okay, what do we do? Do you know the Great Depression, how bad it was? I'm going to ask this question. How many of you were there? Five. Um, all I can do is read stories about it. All I do is read stories where, where people got up at five in the morning to get in the bread line to hopefully by noon get a little bit of bread for their family. I can read about people who had great wealth in the banks who ended up with nothing. I can read where people who, who were huge CEOs of corporations were sweeping streets for the city trying to raise a dollar. You read all things, and the ministers got together, and, and this is what they had. So back during the dark days of 1929, a group of ministers in the Northeast, all graduates of Boston School of Theology, gathered to discuss how they should conduct their Thanksgiving Sunday service. Come <coughs> Mayor? We've discussed for weeks what we're going to do today and how we should do it. And, and this sermon has been worked on and tweaked and done and, and rehashed just back there as he took all my points. <laughs> and uh, I had to go over it, but, but 
they're, they're getting together to see what they should do at Sunday services. Things were about as bad as they could get. No sign of relief was anywhere. The bread lines were just depressingly long. The stock market had plummeted to almost zero. The term Great Depression seemed an apt description for the mood of the country. The ministers thought that they should only lightly touch upon the subject of Thanksgiving, giving indifference to the human misery all about and around them. After all, there was what was there to be thankful for? But it was Dr. William Steiger, pastor of the largest congregation in the East, that rallied the group. This was not a time, he suggested, to give mere passing mention to Thanksgiving, just the opposite. This was the time for the nation to get, get together matters in perspective and thank God for the blessings that are always present in all things. But perhaps we could su suppress, but perhaps suppress due to the intense hardship. So the blessings are always there, but they're, but they're not seeing them because they're all thinking about what? Oh, or us. I suggest to you ministers, the most intense moments of thankfulness are not found in times of plenty, but when difficulties abound. Think about it. The pilgrims, the first Thanksgiving, half of the numbers who came with them lie dead. They were alive, but men without a real country, but still there was a Thanksgiving feast given to God. Their gratitude was not for something, but in something. It was this, that same sense of gratitude that led Abraham Lincoln to formally establish the first Thanksgiving Day in the midst of the National Civil War. When the butcher's list of casualties seemed to have no end, and the very nation struggled for survival, they had a feast. Perhaps in your own life right now, intense hardships are there. You are experiencing your own personal great depression in your life. You ask the question, why should we be thankful today? What do I have to be thankful for? And I could start. We would be at lunch by four if I did every point. I look at my own life and I think, who am I to be so blessed? Who am I to be allowed to be God's mouthpiece? I know this. I'm a sinner. Left to my own demise, I'm something else. Every day I get up, I have to thank God that He chose me to do what I do. What, what a life I live. I mean, my favorite movie, It's a Wonderful Life. That's, that's me. I think that's why I like it so much is because sometimes you think, well, oh, for me, you know, nobody's getting it. I do the sermon, and then I see them out that week, and they're doing the exact same thing I told them not to do. And, and, you know, it has crossed my mind that maybe what I'm going to do is preach the same sermon next week. And then the next week, and finally when they get it, I can move on to something else. But no, it, it's not about me, is it? It's not about what I see. It's about God. It's about what God sees in you. And, and I can't judge whether you've got it or not. Now, if you slept through it, I can judge whether you got it or not. <laughs> and I make notes up here of those of you that and I want you to know that. <coughs> Steve did not get this sermon. No. No. He's always awake over here because I always use them. He's like, what, what? But Thanksgiving is the giving of thanks. On the sign out there it says Thanksgiving, the art of giving thanks. It is an art. Someone gives you a, cold, a, cup, a cup of cold water. Thank you. Somebody says, hey, nice smile. Thank you. It's thanks in all things always. It's thanks when you really don't know what to do. You know, when up, I mean, what did someone do for you today? I saw like eight dozen deviled eggs in that refrigerator back there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are going to eat, but I know what I can eat. Here, I got one. They showed me. They sent me a picture of it last night. All these big eggs like this sitting there, like, and there's one that's about this big. They said, we don't know where it came from. There's only half. This one's yours. 
<laughs> Thank you. I want to turn to one last scripture. Book of Luke. Book of Luke. This is a really neat story. Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. Very neat story which kind of makes the point of where we're at. Luke chapter 17, we're going to start with verse 11. Luke 17, 11. Now on His way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As He was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met Him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity upon us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was killed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were, were there not ten of you that were cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found? <coughs> Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise up and go, your faith has made you well. That's today. That's us. <coughs> I think it rings true. One out of ten gave thanks. One out of ten times that God does something good for us, I think we give thanks. We don't take notice in those daily small things. Everybody do this with me. You ready? Breathe in. And out. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, that I, I can breathe today. You know? For Darren, for Darren. Everybody look left. Look left. Good, good, good. Look right. Thank you, God. I mean, for the healing, for the things they're doing. I mean, there's constantly things around us that we can give thanks for. This morning, there's 133 of you sitting in this room. Thank God. Thank God that, 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 that you're here. I say this all the time. You are not here by accident or mistake. God had you here today for a reason. Whether it was the words in a song, the words of a prayer, the words of communion, it was like a sermon. Uh, or the sermon itself. God had you here for a reason. And now your job is simply this. Thank God for the time you were here and find out what you're supposed to do with it now. What do I do with this message? Because I'm going to tell you, next week's sermon, Thanksgiving is the art of thanks living. And next week we're going to talk about thanks living. But this week, we want to talk about Thanksgiving. We want to talk about us and Him. This morning I'm so thankful that God came into my life. I'm so thankful that He saw fit to allow me to be His. And this morning, He wants to do the same thing for you. He wants to allow you to be His. He wants to give to you blessings that abound beyond what you could dream. No, this is not a health and wealth sermon. When God comes into your life, life is going to get tough. And there are going to be obstacles and there's going to be detours and there's going to be all kinds of things because Satan doesn't want you there. And I'm thankful to God today, most of all, for this word. Forgive me. Because of His forgiveness, I can stand here and tell you His Word. Without thanks, without forgiveness, what would I have? Nothing. 
I would have all my sins piled upon me to the point that I couldn't stand the weight of it. But this morning I stand here before you and I know this. Clean. Spotless. Without blemish. You know how I know that? Because every week before I come and pray, people are pray. I do that. Before I preach, I stand back there and I say a prayer. My prayer is always this, God, forgive me of whatever's in my life. Forgive me of the sins I don't know of. Forgive me of the sins I do know of and I did. Forgive me all that. Clean me that today I am pure, able to stand here and be your mouthpiece. Now use me. That's not a good word in this life, is it, to be used. But I pray every week, God, now use me for your purpose. That they get. Today, God wants to give you that same cleansing. And God wants to make it available to you. Maybe you're sitting here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ. Maybe this morning is this morning that you do that. That you say, you know what? I want that. I need that. I need to live this life full of thanks that, that God has given me. Look at all the stuff around me and in me that He's given me. Or maybe you're here this morning and you are a believer. You've been baptized in Him. You're walking the walk, but who of us doesn't fall? Who of us doesn't fail? And so this morning we ask Him for that great word. Forgiveness. And as we sing our hymn of invitation, you can make a decision to come and accept Him for the first time, or, or you get there in your seat, take this time to say to Him, you know, purify it. Make me a useful instrument for you this week. That I can do those things you have to do. And then thank you, God, for doing that. I'm going to thank Him today. Because I know He is faithful to do that for me. Or maybe you're sitting here this morning and, and you're a baptized believer and you're living it and, and you've been looking for a place to shine your light. And we'd love for you to shine your light with us. We would love for you to help us to reach the community and show them whose we are. And daily giving thanks to God for that. Whatever your decision, we're going to sing a hymn of invitation as we stand and sing. Thank you, trust us.
Father, we thank You for Your forgiveness that allows us to be righteous in Your eyes, that allows us to do the work that You place before us. And Father, we just thank You for all of it. Our request today is that You will be with us this afternoon, that You will bless our feast together, that You will inhabit our fellowship, and Father, that You will be with us there as we share and feast. Thanks. And a thanks mostly because of You. Father, just guide and bless us through this time. We thank you for the service. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. 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 Um, real quick, gentlemen, there's tables for that door all the way out in the garage. We have those. We start spinning some chairs. And we'll get everything set up so that we can eat. Come outside and go on.